Hi guys, um, for today's discussion, we would be talking about uh, section two, uh, which is arts in early, arts in the early and modern civilization. Okay, so this basically talks about the history of music, looking into the music time timeline and uh, the contemporary music. Okay, now for uh, the history of music, in the beginning was the voice. Voice is uh, sounding breath, the audible sign of life. And this was according to Otto Jesperson's word. Okay, now uh, Otto Jesperson is the one who studied about the language origin of uh, human beings. Okay, now he, ha uh, he helped revol revolutionize language teaching in Europe and contributed greatly to the advancement of phonetics linguistic theory, and the history of um, English, okay? Now, um, in addition to that, according to him, uh, Bow Wow, for example, okay, we know that sound uh, is uh, the sound of, uh, say, or when we refer to a dog, right? So Bow Wow, for example, uh, with this sound, uh, people imitate, you know, the sounds from their environment. And uh, say for example, um, with the words poo poo, okay, people make instinctive sounds related to emotions, body functions, and pain. Now, uh, for ding dong, yeah, people make oral gestures, okay. And uh, say another example on, uh, you know, sound or language is lala, okay. People work together and produce rhythmic sounds. So with the music, people make sounds associated with love, play, and singing. Okay, now all those that I've mentioned, the bawa, poo poo, and the lala are different kinds of theories in language. Okay. Moreover, in the nineteen nineties, history scholars suggested our ancestors began communicating some two million years ago okay with the emotional tones they call vocal grooming okay to cement ties on a large scale now historians were actually looking for a way to explain the evolution of uh, language okay but somehow experts uh think that you know the emphasis would be on the early importance of uh, tone and uh, this would show that the use of emotional tones would strengthen social cohesion and it might also somewhat explain the origin of music okay and uh, later on there was a search for formal music now a bone flute was found in the holy fells cave which was discovered near Ulm in Germany dating back 43,000 years ago okay now this five hold flute has a v-shaped mouthpiece and is made from a uh, vulture wing okay and uh, yes this was also believed to come from a uh, yeah a mouthpiece to have come from a vulture wing and some scholars however believe that the said holes are caused by the teeth of carnivorous animals trying to dig into the bone itself okay now of course uh, this was also likely the world's oldest recognizable musical instrument and uh, it pushes back humanity's musical roots okay according to new studies with uh, the vulture bone flute Okay, and some say that, uh, you know, this artifact could have been an added evidence that music may have, say, given the first European modern humans a strategic advantage over Neanderthals. Okay, so, uh, this uh, V-shaped mouthpiece uh, is around 8 millimeters wide and was originally about uh, 13 inches or 34 centimeters long. And uh, yeah, some other artifacts were also found like the mammoth ivory flutes. And uh, this was also another challenging thing, uh, you know, or another challenging discovery. Okay, 
Now, music, music may also have been considered by, uh, uh, you know, the modern man or homo sapiens as a cultural accomplishment that gave the first, you know, European settlers an advantage over their now extinct uh, cousins, the homo neanderthalis. Now, the ancient flutes are evidence for an early musical tradition that likely helped modern humans communicate and form tighter social bonds as according to uh, history. Okay. Now, yes, these um, artifacts would also help us, help us in how we even started with, uh, you know, our communication and uh, thereby, you know, forming, uh, you know, language in the sounds that we use today. Okay, now, you also have the wooden box called as Standard of Ur, and this was an earth in the 1950s. Okay, um, from an ancient Sumerian cemetery dating around 2600 BCE. Now, the wooden box depicting the people at a banquet, several animals, many soldiers, a king, and a musician playing the lyre. Okay. Also found in the same cemetery were uh, actual lyres, and one of which is called the Queen's Lyre, in the Queen of uh, the grave of Queen Puabi. The Queen's Lyre and the other har harps found in the dig are thought to be the world's oldest surviving stringed instruments. And here you have the hymn to Nikal between 19 or 1450 rather to 1250 BC, a cuneiform artifact written in Hurrian, a Sumerian dialect in a tablet dedicated to the wife of a moon god. The music in the tablets were referred to as the Hurrian songs or as the Hurrian cult hymns. As for uh, Enhedwana, okay, this was an Akkadian priest priestess and believed to be the earliest music composer. Uh, this was back in 2285 to 2250 BCE. She is best known for her works, Inin Segura, Nin Mensara, and Inimehusa which were hymns to the goddess Inanna, reflecting three different themes of ancient religious faith. Okay, these three themes include war, governance, and homemaking and intimacy. Now, for the music in Egypt, okay, the music in Egypt uh, did not notate their... Uh, but the Egyptians did not notate their music before the Greco-Roman period. So when it comes to attempts in uh, say, yeah, attempts in uh, trying to reconstruct a pharaonic uh, music, it remains speculative. Okay, so what they only have are representational evidence which can give a general idea of the sound of Egyptian music. Okay, now for a temple, uh, temple ritual music, uh, this was largely a matter of dancing and the rattling of the sistrum, okay, accompanied by uh, the voice and sometimes with the harp or uh, a percussion. Okay, so a sistrum is, uh, you know, something that which is being shaken. A musical instrument of the percussion family, chiefly associated with ancient Egypt. So it has, you know, a U-shaped metal frame made of brass. Okay. So basically, um, in making the sistrum uh, sound, you just have to shake it. Now, for the Egyptian Nesyamun. He lived during the politically volatile region of Pharaoh Ramses XI during 1099 to 1069 BCE, over 3,000 years ago, working as a scribe and priest at the state temple of Karnak in Thebes, now known as Luxor. As a priest, he would have needed a strong voice not only for his speech, but in uh, singing as well. Okay. Now, you have to remember that uh, during that time, there were no microphones. So in order for you to be heard by people, okay, you have to modulate your voice. But it's not like you are just talking to, you know, 
a few people you're talking you are ta actually talking to hundreds and thousands of uh people so when it comes to you know a priest's voice uh it has to have a uh, a deep tone in which people would be able to yeah a deep tone a, a strong voice a what else could you how else could you describe it say a loud voice there a loud voice now the only um special thing about uh, this priest is that you know in order to study how he sounded like during the uh during his time rather um his voice box was reconstructed because when his uh, mummified corpse was found uh scientists were able to you know find out that his uh, throat and trachea were uh, well preserved okay so they tried to reconstruct and simulate how the priest would you know would have sounded if he were alive and uh, fortunate enough they were able to successfully do so okay but uh for the reconstructed voice of another mummy in his time uh mummy Ozzi, <laughs> a mummified corpse huh um of course scientists maintain that reconstruction was largely speculative even with uh, Nesyamun's almost perfectly preserved vocal tract. Okay, so I think this was still subject for further research, although everything at present, especially with the advent of science and technology, technological advancement that we have, everything is most likely possible. But this was way back in 2016. Okay. Anyway, now when Nesyamun died, yeah, that's like uh, what I've mentioned earlier, his voice fell silent, but 3,000 years on, a team of researchers have brought it back to life when they found out that his larynx is still intact. They were able to produce a 3D printed voice box based on Ness Yaman's voice tract. And this was scanned to establish its precise dimension. Okay, now on ancient Greek music or musica, this has long posed a maddening uh, enigma. Okay, yet music was ubiquitous in classical Greece. Okay. Uh, with most of the poetry from around 750 to 350 BCE. Okay. Now, yeah, they were like the songs of Homer, Apo, and many others that were, com yeah, were composed and performed as song music and sometimes uh, accompanied by dance. Okay. Now, for most instance, when it comes to Greek um, music, it forms part of, you know, the ancient uh, Greek theater. And then later influences the Roman Empire, the Eastern Europe, and the Byzantine Empire, okay, which changed the form and style of Greek music. Some of its uh, composers include uh, Nikolaos Montrosos, Spiridon Zindas, Spiridon Samaras, they're just to name a few. And uh, of course, Greek music was unique in its uh, own way. Okay, And for Greek music, especially, say, one example of Greek music is the folk Greek music, it contained only one genre known as the Greek demotico. Uh, demotico okay. Uh, it also refers to uh, Greek traditional or Greek popular songs and music of their time. Okay. Now, the function of Greek music is uh, viewed as quite literally a gift from gods. The invention of specific instruments is attributed to particular deities like Hermes, okay, the lyre, Pan, the syrinx, or Pan pipes. And Athena, the aulus, or flute. Now, in Greek mythology, the muses personified the various elements of music and were said to entertain the gods on Mount Olympus with their divine music, dancing, and singing. Now, for uh, Greek music, okay, now, 
on the philosophical side of things, music also became an element of philosophical study, okay? notably by the followers of Pythagoras, who believed that music was a mathematical expression uh, with a cosmic order. Okay, and... Uh, For its ethical beliefs, one of the most uh, unique contributions of the Greeks okay, made to the history and development of music is that it can have a moral and emotional effect on the listener and his or her soul. So uh, during which, uh, under Greek music, they were able to study how music affects an individual. Okay, And in addition to that, uh, yes, music also has an ethical role in society, okay? Music was also held to believe, or rather held to, ha held to believe that it would also have therapeutic uh, benefits, even medicinal powers over physical and uh, mental illnesses, okay? Now, the hydrolysis is the organ of Cassibios, posted by water, the first keyboard instrument in the world and believed to be invented during the 3rd century BCE by the Hellenistic uh, scientist Cassibius of Alexandria. Okay. On uh, Roman music, Of course, this was part of Roman culture from earliest times and was more on monophonic, okay? It's more on monophonic consisting of single melodies. And uh, it was played at various social occasions like funerals, uh, sacrifices, competitions, and musical plays. Roman music was also influenced by Greek music and also influenced the local music of the countries where the Romani went or settled. Uh, yeah, in addition, some Roman instruments and melodies may have also been uh, constructed by modern groups. Okay. Now, ancient Roman music was influenced by Etruscan, Etruscan and Greek music. Later on during the empire, there were also influences from Gaul, okay, meaning North America, Africa rather, North Africa and Asia Minor. Roman music was also used on various occasions, including entertainment spectacles, such as gladiator fights, public events, military parades, religious events, such as weddings, rituals, and sacrifices or funerals, just like what I mentioned earlier. Of course, under Roman music, wind instruments um, were also used, and they included the brass percussion instruments as well as stringed instruments. The tuba here uh, was like a long wind instrument made of bronze and similar to a trumpet. Okay, it had a conical mouthpiece which was detachable and it was used by the military and in public events and spectacles. As for stringed instruments, uh, Romans also had a beautiful string instrument such as the lyra, the cithara, the lute, or the harp. As for the lyra, it actually came from Greece and it was made of a tortoise shell or a wooden sounding body. Okay, it has two arms and made of animal horn or wood and strings attached to a crossbar stretching to the sounding body or shell. As for the sitara, it gradually replaced the lyra and the sitara also came from the Greece, okay, from Greece influence and was similar to the lyra but only larger. Okay, so here you have the women playing the sephara. This is a fresco uh, dating from 30 to 40 CE. Okay. For percussion instruments, the Romans had bells, tambourines called timpana. Uh, these are rattles made of wood or metal or the scabellium uh, used to beat time. They also had other percussion instruments such as the timpani and the sistrum. Okay. And that came from Egyptian influence which was like a rattle made of bronze. They also have the cymbala, which were symbols that were clashed together to produce sounds. Okay, now let's look into the major musical period. Okay. 
Now, during the first century BCE, okay, um, the oldest musical composition to have survived in its uh, entirety is uh, the Cyclos Epitaph. Okay, now it is believed to be the oldest. Okay surviving musical composition which emerged from the ruins of ancient city of Trales. Uh, this was close to the city of Aydin in which is now Turkey. Okay. And where once the ancient Greek civilization also uh, stretched. Okay. So the Cyclus Epitaph was discovered sometime in 1885. Okay. And uh, yeah, English translation translation of the lyrics are distilled into just uh, four lines. Okay. Now, it is believed that yeah, the four lines, uh, or rather. Okay. Yeah, it was also believed to be a song found engraved on an ancient marble column used to mark a woman's gravesite in Turkey, saying, I am a tombstone, an image. Okay, uh, this was according to the inscription found on the Cyclos um, epitaph. Okay, now, like the or like a memento mori, the lines inscribed rather remind us that everything in life is. Uh, transient and that our days should be fully grasped and well spent okay now of course uh, the cyclus epitaph is dated many centuries after the hurry and hymn however uh, it remains the earliest known fully preserved musical work in the world and it is also the sole complete work that has been saved from ancient greece okay Okay, so this is the Cyclos um, epitaph and what it looks like. Okay. Now, uh, Guido di Arezzo, uh, a medieval theorist of the 11th century. Okay, Arezzo was an Italian and pedagogue of the medieval era that laid out the foundations of mid, uh, medieval era. He is regarded as the inventor of modern staff notation, the Dory Me that we are all very popular of. And uh, this replaced the predominant pneumatic notation that was thus massively influential to the development of Western uh, music as well as uh, practice. Okay. Now, oh. medieval, though we can assume that music began far before 1150, the medieval period is the first in which we can be sure as to how music sounded during this time. Okay, most noted manuscripts from the medieval period came from the church or places connected to the church. And so most pieces have a religious subject when it comes to, you know, the music. The introduction of harmony in both voice and instruments began in the medieval uh, period. Okay, so let's look into uh, the characteristics. Okay, the characteristics of... Uh, Medieval music. Okay. Again, it's monophonic in texture. Uh, church nodes, church modes with tonality. Okay. It would also have a chanting rhythm or repetitive quality. Large vocal works or polyphonic harmony. Small vocal works, plain chant. Instrumental for dances. Okay. For some of the three notable composers during the medieval era, you have John Dunstable. He is an English composer who influenced the transition between late medieval and early Renaissance music. Okay, so the influence that Dunstable has is sweet, sonorous music. He was also the first English composer that have influence on other European composers. Okay, so for Dunstable, his treatment of harmony and equality of the vocal bars was on an unusual uh treatment okay it was unique in its own way for adam de la Halle, a poet 
musician and innovator of the earliest trans uh, secular theater. He is the originator of the polyphonic rondeau, okay, one of the very first authors of musical drama and European vernacular drama, as well as a mature, innovative use of the voice. Okay. Philip de Vitry, a uh, French composer, okay, he is also a music theorist and poet. He was an accomplished, innovative, and influential composer, as well as author of the Ars Nova Treatise. He also introduced the new method of measuring rhythm, which was uh, allowed for syncopation and, uh, you know, to be easily implemented. And the concept of which, uh, you know, includes time uh, signature. For Renaissance music, this started sometime between 1400 to 1600. Uh, and for the Renaissance music, it brought significantly increased amounts of harmony. Okay. Now, it, they also include instrumental pieces and polyphony into music. As most composers were focused on uh, choral music, okay, religious music also continued and uh, it flourished throughout the entire Renaissance period, including uh, new forms, okay, new forms such as masses, anthems, psalms, and uh, motets. Okay. Now, okay. in addition to Renaissance music, this was also one of the most pronounced features of early Renaissance European art music. The increasing reliance on the uh, interval of the third and inversion of the sixth. Okay. Uh, polyphony is the use of multiple independent uh, melodic lines performed simultaneously. And this became increasingly elaborate throughout the 14th century. Okay? It also would include highly independent voices okay? for both in vocal music and in instrumental music. Okay? So for the characteristics of uh, Renaissance music, it is uh, richer in texture. Okay. It has uh, with the richer in texture with four or more independent melodic parts being performed simultaneously. Okay, that's why it's being called as polyphonic. Okay, and this is one of the most defining features of uh, Renaissance music. You also have the blending. Okay, the blending rather than contrasting of melodic lines in the musical texture and harmony. Okay, harmony that is placed a greater concern on the smooth flow of music and its progression of chords. Now, for the development of uh, polyphony, it produced uh, the notable changes in musical instruments that mark the Renaissance from the Middle Ages, okay, musically. It also used to encourage the utilization of larger ensembles and demanded sets of instruments that would blend together across the whole vocal range okay now then you also have uh, church music some pieces were intended for an a cappella a cappella performance mainly contrapuntal okay now contrapuntal okay, is uh, you know a counterpoint uh, between two or more musical lines which are harmonically interdependent, yet independent in rhythm and uh, melodic contour. Okay. That's uh, contrapuntal. Okay. Relating to or a characteristic of or according to the rules of counterpoint. Yeah. Okay. Having two or more independent but harmonically related parts sounding together okay 
Now, lots of vocal pieces and dances for secular music is also another characteristic of Renaissance music. Religious pieces are still you know, considered as sacred music. Another characteristic is the timbers of Renaissance musical instruments. Okay, so in here, musical instruments, family forming. Okay, now for Renaissance music, three of the notable composers during that period, you have William Beard, okay, an English organist and composer of the Shakespearean age who is best known for his development of the English madrigal. Okay, now for the English uh, madrigal, This is, um, you know, a magical school that was brief and intense, brief but intense, flowering of the musical uh, madrigal in England, mostly from 1588 to, say, 1627. And uh, along with the composers who produced them, the English madrigals were an a cappella, okay, an a cappella, predominantly light in style, and generally began as either copies or, you know, uh, direct translations of Italian models. So in an English madrigal school or an English madrigal, uh, madrigal group, an a cappella group, there were around uh, three to six voices. Okay? Three to six voices. Now, yeah. Of course, um, he also wrote the virginal and organ music that elevated the English keyboard style. And Beard also composed a series of fantasias, okay, a great deal of contrapuntal instrumental music. For John Dowland, okay, John Dowland was the most famous you know, uh, composer in, hero, in his era when it comes to his lute songs. Okay. Now, Lute songs is given to a music style from the late 16th century to the early 17th century. Okay, so meaning late Renaissance to early Baroque period. And uh, they could uh, be popularly observed in countries like England and France. So in here, the lute songs were generally in strophic or more, verse repeating with, homo for, uh, with homo, homo, homophonic homophonic texture yo. and the composer was written uh, for a solo voice within an accompaniment so the accompaniment instrument here is the uh, lute okay yeah now of course uh, for John Dowland he was in effect an Elizabethan, uh, an Elizabethan era pop musician Okay. The dark, wistful mood that pervades Dowland's lute music was in its day a sign of maturity and independence. For Orland Gibbons, Orland Gibbons is an English composer, an organist, and one of the last great figures of the English polyphonic school. He is well known for his sacred choral music, and he was also among the first major English choral composers, schooled entirely in the Protestant doctrine. And his highly polished English anthems are among the finest in the repertoire. Okay. Now, looking forward for uh, Baroque music. Okay, so for Baroque music, uh, the music refers to the period or dominant style of Western classical music. So... This was uh, composed from uh, 1600 to 1750. Okay, so the Baroque style followed the Renaissance uh, period, followed by the Classical period after a short transition, or let's just say the Gallant uh, style. Okay, so the Gallant style refers to the style which was fashionable from 1720 to 1770s. And this movement referred to a return to simplicity and immediacy of appeal after the complexity of the late Baroque era. Okay. Now, during the Baroque period, uh, this is commonly known for complex pieces and intricate harmonies. 
Okay. This also laid the groundwork for the next 300 years of music. Modern orchestra was born okay, along with opera, the concerto, sonata, and cantata. Choral music was no longer king as composers turned into instrumental works for various ensembles. Now for the characteristics of uh, Baroque music, okay, so you have the uh, basso continuo. Okay. Basso continuo or figured bass, one mood throughout the entire piece. And then you also have the important string sections. The modes replaced by the major or minor key system. There was also multiform and styles in one piece. There's also exuberant in rhythm, long ornamented melodies. Okay, for three notable composers during the Baroque era, you have John Sebastian Bach. Okay, so he, without a doubt, was one of the most, uh, or rather, the world's great geniuses to have ever walked the stage of music history. Bach is known to be the father of music, okay? And Bach had a prestigious musical lineage and took on various organist positions during the early 18th century. He created the famous compositions like Toccata and Fugue in D minor, okay? Mass in B minor, Badenberg Concertos, and the well-tempered Clavier. Okay, another notable composer is George Friedrich Handel. Okay, in the Olympic Games of Music History, Bach and Handel share the gold medal platform okay, because they are the greatest composers during the Baroque era. For George Friedrich Handel, uh, he is a German-born British Baroque composer who spent the bulk of his career in London. Okay, Handel was well known for his operas, oratorios, anthems, and organ concertos. He was strongly influenced by both the great composers of the Italian Baroque. Then you have Antonio Vivaldi, okay, a prolific composer who created hundreds of works, and he became renowned for his concertos in Baroque style, becoming a highly influential innovator in form and pattern. He was also known for his operas, including Agrippo and Bahazet. Okay, Vivaldi influenced young musicians of his day and fellow composers through his unique rise of rhythm and tonality, as well as the ritornello form. Okay. Now, for uh, the ritornello, the ritornello is like, you know, uh, with the word itself, uh, an Italian word, little return, yun, little return. Okay, it is a recurring passage in Renaissance music and Baroque music for orchestra or chorus. Okay, so yung retornello was uh, used by uh, the 14th century madrigal, okay, uh, referring to the final lines, final lines of the music. Okay. Little return. Okay. Now, of course, um, he was also, uh, this rather also became a trademark for his conciertos. Okay. For Antonio Vivaldi, the ritornello form became his own trademark. Okay. Now, for 1750 to 1820, the classical music. Okay. For the classical music, okay, this refers to the art of the Western world. Okay, it is also considered to be distinct from Western folk music and popular music traditions. Okay. It is sometimes distinguished as uh, Western classical music, as the term classical music also applies to non-Western art. The term classical, the term classical music also applies to non-Western art music. Okay, so in uh, classical music, it is often characterized by formality and complexity in its musical form and harmonic organization. Okay, still again with particular use of polyphony. Okay, so again for polyphony, this is a type of musical texture consisting two or more simultaneous lines of independent melody. Okay, as composed or rather as opposed to a musical texture with just one voice, the monophony. Okay, so 
uh, a texture with one dominant melodic voice accompanied by chords or uh, homophony. Now, of course, uh, the classical uh, period expanded upon the Baroque period, adding a majorly influential development of the concerto, symphony, sonata, trio, and quartet. This period may not add any major instrumentation, say the harpsichord, which was officially replaced with the piano. Orchestras also increased in size during the classical uh, era, and the range as well as power and instrumentation also increased. Overall, classical had a lighter, more evident texture than Baroque music, making it less complicated, elegant, and more sophisticated. Okay, so for uh, the characteristics of classical music, you have emphasis on elegance and balance, short, well-balanced melodies, and clear-cut question and answer phrases. Uh, another characteristic is, you know, the mainly simple diatonic harmony. Okay, so dia diatonic means using notes which belong to the key rather than chromatic notes which are outside the key. Okay. And another characteristic on classical music is the use of contrasting moods. Okay, now, for uh, the three notable uh, composers during the classical era, okay, you have Franz Joseph Haydn. Haydn is remembered as the first great symphonist and the composer who essentially invented the string quartet okay now for the string quartet this yeah the string quartet can refer to either a type of musical composition or a group of four people okay four people who play them okay and many composers during the mid 18th century usually uh use string quartets okay they would write music using string quartets associated with musical ensembles consisting of two violinists a violinist and a cellist okay now the principal engineer of the classical style uh he also exerted influence in the likes of mozart his student ludwig van beethoven and others haydn never had any children but the musicians who worked for him called him papa haydn for he is popularly known as the father of symphony. Then you have uh, Franz Schubert, an Austri Austrian composer who bridged the worlds of classical and romantic music. He is noted for the melody and harmony in his songs and chamber music. Among other works are Symphony No. 9 in C Major, The Great in 1828. Schubert left behind a vast oeuvre of including more than uh 600 secular vocal works now seven complete symphonies circuit music operas incidental music and a large body of piano chamber music okay now you also have ludwig van beethoven a german composer the predominant musical figure in transitional period between the classical and romantic eras. Okay, so he is widely regarded as the greatest composer who ever lived. Okay, now Ludwig van Beethoven uh, dominates the period of musical history as one as no one else ever before or since. Okay, he is well rooted in the classical traditions of Joseph Haydn and Mozart, and his art reaches out to encompass the new spirit of humanism and incipient incipient nationalism okay and the one of the most popular of them all in the classical era is wolfgang amadeus mozart okay another austrian composer widely recognized as one of the world's greatest composers in the history of western music unlike any other composer in musical history he wrote in all the musical genres of his day and excelled in every one of which now, his taste, his command of form, and his range of expression have made him seem the most universal of all composers. Okay. Now, for the romantic music, 
Okay. The romantic music took classical music and added overwhelming amounts of intensity and uh, expression. Okay. Now, it also, uh, you know, for the composers, they would actually, you, they would usually uh, let go of heavily structured pieces and gravitate towards drama and uh, emotion. Okay, so instrumentation became uh, more prominent, which orchestras growing to higher numbers than ever. Public concerts and operas moved away from the exclusivity of royalty and riches and into the hands of urban middle-class society for all to enjoy. Okay, so let's look into some of the characteristics of uh, romantic music. Okay, now... There is freedom of form and design. It was more personal and emotional. Okay, the songs like melodies are lyrical, as well as many chromatic harmo uh, harmonies and discords. Dramatic contrast of dynamics and pitch could also be observed. And uh, the orchestras during the Romantic era have increased okay, in number due mainly to brass and the invention of the valve. Okay, there was also a wide variety of pieces referring to operas. Program music, the music that tells a story, and dramatic contrast of dynamics and pitch. Shape was also brought to work through the use of recurring themes. A okay, great technical virtuosity could also be observed during the Romantic era in the advent of music. Nationalism okay, could also be you know, another characteristic of uh, Romantic music. Okay, for some of the great your giant classical composers during the Romantic era, you have Friedrich Chopin, okay, from 1810 to 1849. He was a virtuoso pianist who wrote almost exclusively for the instrument. Now, the piano went through significant changes during the 19th century as composers grew more ambitious in range, colors, and dynamics. It became a symbol of Romanticism and was enlarged to suit the needs of music makers like Chopin. Okay. There's also nocturnes, waltzes, and etudes that are still among the most beloved repertoire of pianists today. Franz Liszt okay, is another great pianist and composer. He was dubbed as the world's first rock star. Okay, so he took the virtuoso pianism into new heights, and the great Hungarian composer among the repertoire, you'll recognize the mind-boggling Fiendish La Campanella. Okay, at his piano recitals, his fans would tear off their clothes and scream out his name. That's why uh, the German poet uh, Heinrich Hein uh, styled or rather dubbed or called this as Listomania. Okay. As for Giuseppe Verdi, the undisputed king of Italian opera, Verdi is known primarily along with his monumental Requiem. Okay. There were great stage works like La Travietta, Rigoletto, Nabucco, Aida, La Forza del Destino, Il Trovatore, and the most of Verdi's uh, operas became an essential part of Italy's national identity. Okay? And these choruses were adopted as anthems of Italian freedom fighters. Okay? So to Italy in the 19th century, Verdi was the musical monarch. Okay? So all of those... Um, uh, the medieval, the Baroque, the classical music all have contributed to the kind of music that we have now, the 20th century music. Okay, so for the 20th century music, it has changed dramatically due to the hostile political climate, advances in technology, huge shift in style, and many composers were struggling to build any further on the music of generations. Okay reacted against established musical trends, creating new forms or exciting new forms and styles of music. Okay, so for the 20th century music, modernism can be observed about uh, being radical and different in musical style. And for, for the first time, musicians and audiences realized that music didn't have to be confined to tradition. Okay. 
but by the 1960s, this idea had run out of stream. Okay, ran out of steam, and the next generation of serious composers were relaxed and had a wider palette of musical colors to work with the influences from other cultures, popular music, ancient music, and the experiments of modernism. So for some of the characteristics of century, 20th century music, you have timber, which refers to all sound are possible and experimental, harmony, there's an intricate harmony and dissonance, or new chord structure, tonality, alternatives to the traditional tonal system, and the rhythms, okay, the changing meters. I also have the melody, okay, which is uh, experimental, style, which is vague outlines of melody and rhythm, texture, contrapuntal and homophonic, or form which can be controlled to an almost infinite degree and experimental. Instruments include electronic intervention. Okay. Now, for uh, Impressionism, okay, talking about the 20th century music in 1890-1925, this originated in France. And for Musical Impressionism, this is characterized by suggestion and atmosphere. And as shows the emotional excesses of the Romantic era. So in here, expressionists would rather favor short forms such as the nocturne, arabesque, and prelude, and often explored uncommon scales such as the whole tone scale. Okay. Now what do we mean when we say the whole tone scale? Okay, so for the whole tone scale, it refers to uh, a scale in which each note is separate from its neighbors by the interval of a whole note. Okay, so there is, uh, you know, in a 12-tone uh, temperament, there are only two complementary whole tone scales, both the sixth note <clears throat> or hexatonic scales. Okay. One of the most noted um, impressionist uh, musician okay, is Claude Debussy. Now, his music is noted for its sensory content and frequent use of atonality. Okay. <clears throat> Atonality, um, in the broadest sense, is music that lacks a tonal center or key, okay, atonality. And 20th century music up to the present day um, has this kind of um, you know, characteristic to it, okay. Now, the French literary style of this period was known as symbolism, and this movement directly inspired Debussy both as a composer and an active cultural participant. He was also among the most influential composers of the late 19th and 20th century. Now, the term expressionism was originally, originally borrowed from visual art and literature. Okay? So in here, artists created vivid pictures, distorting colors and shapes to make unrealistic images that suggested strong emotions. So in music, Okay, in application of expressionism, the expressionist composer poured intense emotional expression into their music and explored the subconscious mind of the listener, okay, of the human being. Okay, so one uh, expressionist artist, okay, or musician is Arnold Schoenberg. He was an Austrian-born composer, a music theorist, a teacher, writer, and painter, widely considered as one of the most influential composers of the 20th century. He was associated with the Expressionist movement in German poetry, art, and leader of the Second Vienna School. Okay, he also created new methods of musical composition involving atonality, namely serialism and the 12-tone role. Okay, now for serialism, serialism is a method of composition 
using a series of pitches, rhythms, dynamics, timbres, or other musical elements. Okay, so again, serialism began primarily with Arnold Schoenberg's 12-tone technique. Okay, though some of his uh, contemporaries were also working to establish, you know, serialism as a form of post-tonal thinking. Okay, now as for uh, the 12-tone technique, Okay. The twelve tone technique, um, also known as uh, dodecaphony or twelve tone serialism, okay, a method of musical composition, uh, first devised by Austrian composer Josef Matthias Hauer. Okay, uh, he also published the Law of Twelve uh, Twelve Tones, okay, which was further elaborated on and uh, established by Arnold Schoenberg. Okay, so for the modern period of music from 1890 to 18, 1975, 1890 to 1975, this was a period of diverse reactions in challenging and interpreting old categories of music okay, that led to new ways of organizing and approaching harmonic, melodic, sonic, and rhythmic aspects of music, okay, identifiable to a period of modernism in the arts. Now, the word modern is associated with innovation, okay? So, it was during this era that there was innovation in terms of music from the past, okay? In terms of linguistic plurality, which is to say that no single music genre ever assumed a dominant position, okay? Igor uh, Stravinsky, uh, his compositional career was notable for its stylistic diversity, and he is most famous for his three ballets, The Firebird, Petrushka, and The Rite of Spring. Most importantly, he was noted for his constantly, you know, for constantly reinventing music and being an overall musical revolutionary, sometimes offending people with his drastic ideas along the way. Okay. For uh, the postmodern music, which started from 1930s to 1960s, okay, this is music in art music tradition okay music in art music uh, tradition okay now of course uh it also describes any music that follows a statical and philosophical trends of postmodernism. so again uh just like in art Okay, but this time we're just talking about music. Okay, uh, it follows that postmodern music questions the tight definitions and categories of academic disciplines, which they regard simply as the remnants of modernity. So again, postmodern music was a reaction to modernism, okay, which is defined as oppositional to modernistic music. And uh, yeah, postmodern re uh, postmodernism rejects the idea of uh, an objective uh, reality. Okay, objective reality meaning you know the existence as such. Okay, so the world of facts, independent of anyone's thoughts, opinions, or feelings. Knowledge of objective reality is gained by the five senses. Okay, the sight, the hearing, the touch, taste, and smell. So, for object reality, at the young existence as such. Okay. Now, for artists and during the postmodern era, you have John Milton Cage, John Milton Cage Jr. or John Cage. He was an American composer, music theorist, artist, and composer. Uh, philosopher. He is a pioneer of interdeterminacy in music, electroacoustic music, and non standard use of musical instruments. So, Cage was one of the leading figures of the post war avant garde. Okay, so his best known works are the 433 seconds or 4 minutes and 33 seconds in 1952. Okay, now talking about contemporary music. Okay, so for uh, contemporary 
music, this refers to, you know, the classical music composed close to the present day music. So meaning the beginning of the 21st century, sometimes even referred to as post, okay, post-1945, okay, just right after the post-modernist, uh, post-modern uh, era, okay. And uh, of course, contemporary music is continually, continuously evolving in style, okay, and it is generally based on originality and artist's expression. So for contemporary artists, they use dissonances and tried to disobey or experiment the laws that music had followed for many years. Okay, so for the characteristics of contemporary music, which started from 1945 to present, there is few lyrical melodies than other periods, the use of dissonant harmonies, experimental and common and or complex rhythms, we also have percussiveness, the greater use of percussion, brass and woodwind instruments, and uh, also observed under the contemporary music is the frequent use of synthetic and electronic sounds. Now, there are uh, four classifications of music categories under contemporary music. You have neo-romanticism, minimalism, postmodernism, and serialism. Okay, so let's look into the differences of these uh, music categories. For neo-romanticism, uh, the music appeals more to the emotional expression associated with 19th century Romanticism art. In the 1940s, uh, composers tried to create a new language based on no classism structures. Of course, uh, they were trying to address an aesthetic issues from the social rather than the individual perspective. Okay. So Le June France, in fact, conceptualized their music as neo-romantic to suggest a rupture in, uh, you know, with modern, uh, modernistic tendencies. Samuel Barber is an example of a neo-romantic uh, musician. Okay? He is an American composer who is considered one of the most expressive representatives of the lyric and romantic trends of the 20th century music. He established his reputation over his overture to the School for Scandal in 1933 based on Richard Sheridan's comedy by that name and with the music for, from a scene of uh, Shelley in 1935, inspired by the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. Okay, on minimalism, okay, it's in the word itself. Okay, generally, minimal music is simplicity. Okay, another form of art of music or other compositional practice, and it employs limited or minimal music materials. Okay, so the prominent feature of minimalism, minimalism is, uh, you know, would include the repetitive patterns or pulses, the steady drones, consonant harmony, and the reiteration of musical phrases or smaller units. Okay, so one of the most famous... Um, Musicians on uh, minimalism is Stephen Michael Reich. He is an American composer known for his contribution to the development of con yeah, minimal music in the mid to late 1960s. So Reich's work is marked by its use of repetitive figures, slow harmonic rhythm, and canons. In here, he drew additional inspiration from American vernacular music, especially jazz, as well as ethnic and ancient music. So the third uh, you know, uh, category is uh, postmodernism. So in here it tends to be it tends to be self-referential and ironic, and it blurs the boundaries between high art and kitsch. Okay. Professor of Harvard for Literature, Daniel Albright, summarizes the traits of postmodern style as bricolage polystylism, and randomness. As a musical condition, postmodern music is simply the state of music in postmodernity. Okay, now, one of the notable artists under postmodernism is John Adams. 
Okay? The most performed living American composer, Jan Adams, builds on the rhythmic momentum of minimalism but introduces sharp contrasts and a wide range of musical references. He served as composer in residence of the San Francisco Symphony from 1982 to 1985, for which he composes the first major orchestral work, Harmonium, in 1981 and Harmony Lehri in uh, 1985 okay and lastly you have serialism okay serialism is a method of composition using a series of pitches rhythms durations uh what else uh yeah durations and uh dynamics timbers, or other musical elements. So they began primarily with Arnold Schoenberg's 12-tone technique, though some of his contemporaries were also working to establish serialism as a form of post-tonal thinking. And you have uh, okay, a popular musician or artist under serialism whose name is Pierre Boulet. Okay, so Pierre-Louis Joseph Boulet was a French composer, conductor, writer, and founder of several musical institutions, and he was one of the dominant figures of the post-war classical music world. His serial elements and compositions include the pitch, actual tones, sounded, rhythm, dynamics, the volume levels, and attack. Okay, so how the notes are struck and released. Okay, now of course, uh, music is also known as humanity's global language. It has the ability to bring happiness and positivity into people's life. Music brings the creative side of the person because music is creativity in its purest form. It aids in the robust improvement of individual by making it more artistic and inventive. Whatever the great innovation is, it necessitates art creativity, and imagination, all of which are provided by the art of appreciating and making music. Okay? Now, according to Pablo Casals, the greatest respect of an artist can pay to music is to give it life. Okay? So, yeah, this is the end of the discussion for uh, the history of music and uh, yeah the timeline of music in different eras i hope uh, you are able to you know learn from the information presented before you okay so that's all for now and thank you guys for uh, listening okay